Hey everybody, I'm here in uh, Regenex headquarters in Broomfield, Colorado with uh, Regenex founder and chief medical officer, Dr. Chris Centeno. Today we're gonna have a great conversation about umbilical cord blood, we'll talk about that. Be glad to take any of your questions uh, as they come up, uh, just let us know. And um, so uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Centeno. Yeah, so umbilical cord uh, products that are out there can be broken into two major types. One is umbilical cord blood, the other is umbilical cord tissue, and that's usually Wharton's jelly. Um, that's part of the um, umbilical cord, so the umbilical cord has blood in it, um, and another part of the umbilical cord that gives it its stiffness has Wharton's jelly. Uh, now, umbilical cord blood is pretty mesenchymal stem cell poor. Uh, it's got other types of stem cells, but not mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, for instance, in about 10 units of umbilical cord blood from 10 different donors, you'll generally find one or two that will produce enough stem cells to, to culture. Um, and then umbilical cord Wharton's jelly has more mesenchymal stem cells. Now the big problem is we've tested all this stuff and we just sent another batch to CSU and their Translational Medicine Institute to do the testing. And there are no mesenchymal stem cells that are living in any of it. Um, so we tested most recently, uh, RichGen was one product, um, StemL was another, uh, Livion Pure, uh, we tested CharCore, and one other I'm blanking on. Uh, but bottom line, these are all common umbilical cord products. So that's a paper that will get published here relatively soon. Um, but bottom line is, you know, if someone's telling you that there are stem cells in these products, uh, now lots of research showing that's not true. Now they have growth factors, they have cytokines, and those things can promote healing. Um, but as you'll see, I'll do a post tomorrow just looking at the growth factor content of those five products. Um, wasn't great uh, compared to your own platelets. Uh, now there may be unique proteins in some of these that could help. Um, and so I think you'll see some clinical effect, but the question is whether or not you'll see any more clinical effect that you could get from a PRP shot that costs a quarter to a fifth as much. And my guess is probably not. So um, I have a couple questions, but let's get to Kevin's. What do you think about cord blood from outside the U.S. where um, cells are allowed to be cultured? Yeah, so, so there you've got, you know, it's two-edged sword. On the positive side, you can isolate and culture expand the cells. On the negative side, how are you going to know as a, a U.S. citizen whether or not that's being done properly? That's not easy to do. Uh, so that's the problem is uh, there are not really very few controls over that stuff in those countries. So how do you know that you're getting the real deal? And that's, that's a hard, the hardest part of that equation. Yeah, so I'm curious, um, since this is someone else's stuff that's going in, are there any side effects from using someone else's tissue? Yeah, that's a great, uh, really great point. Um, the answer is yes. Um, so if you're using umbilical cord blood or tissue um, that is non-isolated, meaning the kind of stuff that you get here in the United States, then each of those needs to be matched to the donor. So if you get a real umbilical cord stem cell treatment for cancer, as an example, uh, pediatric cancer, all of those are matched to the donor. And that's called HLA matching. So you have to have, you know, you can match uh, three or five or seven, and the closer the match, meaning the more things you try to match on, the less likely it is you're going to have a side effect. Now the problem is that the chiro clinics and the naturopaths and the acupuncturists and the idiot physicians who are using this stuff have absolutely no matching whatsoever, which would be in any other medical context ridiculous uh, because graft versus host disease can happen uh, if you get mismatched stuff, especially if you get mismatched stuff on a repetitive basis. Um, 
And then we get into the culture expanded stuff. Again, you've got the same problem. So Ashley Watts just did a really nice study at Texas A&M showing that even if you culture and isolate those cells, they still have to be matched. Meaning at the end of the day, you don't get a graft versus host disease, but your results depend on how close a match the cells were to the donor. And again, it's not being done, and it calls into question all of the out of the country stuff that's allogeneic. Wow, sounds serious. Uh, Gabby asks a um, question about uh, cervical instability uh, with multiple treatments. Better to get a same day type procedure versus uh, um, uh, cultured cells where you can bank more of them. Yeah, uh, and this is for a CCJ procedure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't do the CCJ procedure down in Grand Cayman. Uh, the facility is not uh, not a good match for that type of procedure. We only do that one place on earth, and that's here in Colorado. So that's the only option. There you go. Adriana, uh, any help with uh, stem cells for arachnoiditis? Um, probably not once it's already scarred down. I think it's... Uh, unlikely that something like this would be effective for arachnoiditis if that's what's causing the problem. Here's a question that I think we can um, already address. Any idea when you'll be able to get FDA approval so those of us who are self-insured can have PICL covered? Yeah, no, so the PICL procedure is for a, that's a same day bone marrow based procedure, so that's a US procedure. Um, there are no FDA approvals for those types of things. That's a surgical procedure. So uh, coverage for the PICL procedure, however, would go through your insurance plan. Um, and we're a long way from getting PICL procedure coverage through an insurance plan. Uh, now, Regenix has about 7 million covered lives. Um, so if you happen to be work for one of those employers, like if you work for John Deere, or you worked for Time, the magazine, or if you worked for you know the largest grocery store chain in the Midwest, all of that would be covered, including the PICL procedure. Um, but that's you know that's a small drop in the bucket, seven million covered lives compared to all the different people out there. So Stacy, if you um, want to let us know who who you're self insured through, maybe we can reach out to them. It's never a quick process, but uh, could be hopeful in the future. Yeah, that's a good point. Mark is one of the experts in talking to these employers about getting coverage. And it's been interesting. It's been, you know, we predicted it was going to be extremely hard to do and difficult to do. Um, but what's interesting is that we've had a lot more traction than I would have expected yeah. in getting uh, coverage for some of this because of the track record of Regenix. Now, that doesn't mean your chiropractor is ever going to see this stuff get covered, but we've gotten it covered. Right, exactly. Track record, and um, we know how to do this and communicate to the employers. And they are suffering, spending so much money. Uh, it's projected that uh, costs are going to go up another 6.5% and double what inflation is. So they're looking for solutions like this. Yeah, they're getting hammered. Um, how do IV stem cells act in the central nervous system? They don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's your answer. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a wise tale. Uh, that's a myth, meaning that the studies that have been done with IV stem cells show about 97% will end up in the lungs. That's called a pulmonary first pass, so they get stuck there. And then uh, only about one in 10,000 to 100,000 cells would ever make it to your brain past the blood-brain barrier. Then you get into the whole thing of if you're getting uh, much, you know, let's say you're getting IV bone marrow. Uh, you probably only have about 100,000 mesenchymal stem cells there. So that means that only 10 of them would make it to your brain. Um, so that's not many. Uh, and then if you're getting uh, amniotic uh, or umbilical cord, there are no live stem cells. So nothing's making it to your brain at that point. Certainly not in the way of stem cells. Uh, Kevin asks, um, can neck muscles and tendons be looked at on, under ultrasound to see uh, if those are damaged or what's the best way to see that? Yeah, neck muscles can. Uh, as far as looking for instability, uh, instability is best looked at under live x-ray. So that's a DMX or digital motion x-ray is usually the best way 
to do that. You can also do that with an upright moving MRI. But frankly, I think DMX is better at looking at that kind of uh, movement. Here's a good, really good question. Why are clinics allowed to offer these treatments that can be dangerous and contain no live stem cells? Yeah, uh, they're all violating the law is the answer, meaning that at the end of the day, um, let's look at what they do. So uh, just so that you understand how this game is played, let's say you and I wanted to come up with a magic stem cell treatment, and I've got seven days to do it. Let's give me two weeks. Um, so the first thing I would do is to call one of the existing uh, companies out there. There's about six or seven that uh, act as uh, tissue banks. We would cut a deal within the first couple days on how we would purchase their product from them. They would private label it for us. Then we would sign a contract with a bunch of orthopedic sales reps, give them 15% of the take. Then we would put up a website claiming that this was a stem cell product not based on any information we had about that, or maybe we do some real, 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 um, you know, superficial testing uh, that will convince a doctor because he doesn't know what he's looking at. Um, and within, uh, and then we, the final step is we go on the FDA website and we register this as a 361. Now, that's illegal what we just did there. It's actually a 351 drug if we're claiming it has stem cells. Even if it doesn't have a live stem cell at all, just the claim makes it a drug. But we'll misregister it as a 361 tissue because that way we can claim that we're FDA registered. In fact, some companies claim they're FDA approved. There is no approval. It's just a free 45 minute registration. And we're done. We'll have sales of a couple million dollars within six months. Uh, now it's all fraud. Uh, there's no stem cells in any of it. Uh, and we just broke the law and uh, if I'm the CEO of that company, I get, could get put in jail, but you know, I can probably close up shop quickly enough to move on uh, to my next scam before anyone finds out. Crazy. Uh, Josh asks if the approximate cost of a spine procedure in Northern California, but before you answer that, he also wonders if he could use his newborn's cord blood, who's going to be born in November. Yeah, that would be illegal to do. Um, so no, you can't do that. Um, if you bank that blood for your kid, that kid's only use of it at this point could, would be pediatric cancer. So it has no other use uh, at this juncture that it would be allowed to be used for in the United States. So realize that the whole cord banking industry is a little bit like buying insurance that won't ever pay off until they get an approval for it to pay off. So we're probably two decades away from approval for a lot of common diseases for cord blood. So your son or daughter might be able to use that at some point in the future, but certainly not in the next five or 10 years. Um, and you would not be able to use it at all for anything. There is no approved use of umbilical cord blood at this point outside of cancer for, uh, for you as well. So you'd be in that same boat. Well, these are great questions, and I want to encourage you, if you know somebody who has a problem, a musculoskeletal problem, who's looking for real solutions, please share this with them so they can find out what's real and what's not, so they don't uh, end up going down the wrong path. Please share this out with them. Stacy asked, she's three months out from her PICL uh, procedure, and what supplements could be beneficial? She says she can't take... Uh, the stem cell support formula, uh, she has an allergy to one of the ingredients in that. Yeah, so I just parted out. Um, uh, we list the ingredients, so literally just go online and, and buy everything else other than what it is you're allergic to. And just, uh, so for instance, if you're allergic to curcumin, there's glucosamine in there, there's chondroitin in there. Those are obviously available as a tag team supplement. Uh, there are other things in there that you can do the same thing with. Um, so that's what I would do if it were me personally, is just eliminate that one ingredient and try to take everything else and just part it out on Amazon. Uh, Ed asks, uh, he's got a shoulder impingement, and if, uh, if we think any of our procedures would be helpful for that. Yeah, Ed, uh, so, um, so normally there's something causing that shoulder pain. There's this concept of impingement that was mostly based on orthopedic surgeons who wanted to cut something out to uh, alleviate the impingement. Now, regrettably, 
all of that research now shows at the end of the day, there really isn't a thing called shoulder impingement, meaning that you can go in there and remove all the stuff and that does absolutely nothing for the shoulder, uh, meaning that's no better than a placebo procedure. Um, so there's something else causing your shoulder pain. I know you got a diagnosis and it, it feels really good to get a diagnosis because you're wandering around the wilderness and you're not sure what's going on with your shoulder, but you probably need to go to another doctor to get a, a more accurate diagnosis about what's causing that shoulder pain. Um, and then let's say it's related to some partial tears in your rotator cuff. PRP works well for that. Let's say it's related to a bigger rotator cuff tear. Stem cells might work for that. Um, or the tear might be too big to even consider stem cells. Or a labral tear might be PRP or stem cells. Or shoulder instability, uh, PRP works well for that. So it all depends on getting that accurate diagnosis, which is sometimes difficult to do. Uh, this is a good question. It's come up before. Uh, since inflammation is critical he to healing, do high-strength fish oil and curcumin supplements affect the inflammatory response? Yeah, they do, but in a different way. So let's just take fish oil because that's a, an interesting one. Um, fish oil has what are called resolvins, which are um, cytokines that actually help to uh, push down inflammation at the appropriate time, meaning they resolve inflammation. Inflammation should be a short-term spike to heal something and then, poof, come off the, the cliff within a day or two or three um, and start to be down-regulated. So the resolvins in fish oil help to blunt that inflammatory response then push it back down. That's normal. The problem is in our American society, diet, lack of exercise, etc., the inflammation tends to last too long, and that's not good. Um, so the answer is uh, those uh, supplements act in a very different way than something like a non anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or Celebrex. Gabby asks, is the tectoral membrane easy to reach in the cervical spine during PICL procedure, or is it still hit or miss? Uh, you know, in that particular procedure, um, it's become more and more routine as we've gotten to about 150 of them. Uh, that would be going over the dens. Most of the work we do is underneath the dens. Uh, so the answer is yes, it can be reached. Um, it may or may not be reliable at this point because we are still learning a lot about uh, work above the dens, whereas everything we've done so far is, well, probably 90% of it's been below the dens. So, um, still, still learning all the things we need to learn in that procedure, and because you know we're the only ones on Earth to do it, it's it's uh, it's a learning process every single time we do it. Although it's mostly dialed in at this point. Kevin asks: Besides checking triglycerides, what else can be checked to optimize uh, before culturing stem cells? Yeah, besides checking uh, triglycerides, uh, diet can be optimized. So try to get on a low glycemic diet. Uh, that stem cell support formula has ingredients in it that we tested in the lab with mesenchymal stem cells. So we like those ingredients. Um, and those are the kind, of, and then activity. Obviously, you know, do anything you can. If you've got to work out in a pool because that offloads your joints, then do that. But activity is a third component of that. Have you seen people with high glucose or hemoglobin A1C? I know you don't check that, but maybe diabetics have issues? Yeah, I mean, all of that's gonna affect your stem cell function negatively. So if you're a type two diabetic or pre-diabetic or have metabolic syndrome, just so that you know, there's sort of metabolic syndrome that a lot of Americans have that then leads to kind of pre-diabetes and then full on type two diabetes, all of those are gonna negatively impact your cells. Which be a re which be the reason to go on that low glycemic or low blood sugar type diet to see if you can get rid of that response or clean it up as much as possible. So, um, how long should I plan in staying in Grand Cayman for a stem cell procedure? Josh asks this. Uh, you know, Josh depends on what we're doing. Some of them might be uh, just a one day procedure on the reinjection. Some might require a pre and post injection which would be a longer stay. Uh, realize there's two ways to do that. One is you can go down and give a sample 
and then come back, do whatever you gotta do, and then go back down at some point and get a reinjection. Or you could stay down there the two weeks while the cells are grown, get some stem cells put in while you're there, and then get the rest frozen for a future date. So there's two different, really two different ways to do it. Craig asks if there's any correlation with HGH before uh, or after a marrow draw and outcome metrics. No, we did that. Well, we did a similar experiment to that. So uh, back in, I want to say that was probably 2013 or so, we actually took a bunch of men and we put them on testosterone uh, and we put them on thyroid. Now all of that will increase your, uh, your HGH levels. Uh, and we optimized them. We, took a, we did their bone marrows before, we did their bone marrows after. We really expected to see a significant improvement in the number of stem cells or the proliferation rate of the stem cells or some positive metric. We did not see any positive metric or any positive stuff happen uh, in those uh, patient stem cells. So uh, regrettably, optimizing hormones didn't seem to make a difference for stem cell function as we could measure it in real patients. Um, Stephen asks, uh, do- And it was interesting, there is a program that will pay for this stuff. Um, she was actually active duty Navy um, so if you contact us, I'll try to have my staff reach out to her and see what that program was. All right, we're back. <laughs> um, great. Okay. Uh, Stacy asks, and she's had the PICL, she seems to be taking uh, one, two steps forward, one back. And but making progress uh, and smaller back steps. Um, any insights on why it's not a straight line of healing? Yeah, I mean, there's a Stacy on, on my YouTube channel. There's a video I did on this. If you just type in under my channel uh, ligament, uh, it'll come up. But basically, what you tend to see is uh, you've got initial inflammatory response. Um, and during that initial inflammatory response, if you have instability for that first week or two, patients might be sore, but they feel pretty good because they're stable. Then the acute inflammation goes away and there's sort of a donut hole where things are kind of back to what they normally are. And then over several months, new tissue gets laid down. Um, and as that new tissue gets laid down, that's in the, in the two, three, four month time frame, even up to six and nine months, patients generally then start to feel the effects of improved stability. And it's not necessarily a straight line. I mean, you're involved, you're, you're depending on things to heal and tighten. So you'll definitely have uh, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. That's a common report. You mentioned something earlier about graft versus host and the more times you get a, a, a somebody else's injection increased likelihood. Yeah. What kind of symptoms do you see and does it happen right away? Yeah, normally it does. So, so you tend to see uh, a rash. Uh, that's, that's a common one. It's a very specific looking rash that tends to be kind of uh, diffuse. Um, and then regrettably, some of the other symptoms are awful and you won't, wouldn't even know until you got really sick. So basically organ damage including liver damage, kidney damage, et cetera. So many times those symptoms don't really pop up until you see the hepatitis meeting the, the orange skin, et cetera, or the orange eyeballs or jaundice. So realize that you need to be very, very careful with that whole thing. I mean, if you're getting any umbilical cord product, it needs to be matched. That's the industry standard that's out there. What has happened is that these alternative medicine offices and other physician idiots that are out there using this stuff have just skipped that step. I don't know why. I think it's obviously they're not from that background. They're, they're not trained in this type of medicine. So they don't understand that it needs to be matched, but it does. So you would need to look at what the match is on the umbilical cord product and the patient. Now that's going to be five, six grand right there, just getting that information. And then you would start at that point with an umbilical cord product, 
So, you know, you see these guys doing a $3,000 umbilical injection. I mean, the matching alone costs more than that, and that's probably why they're not doing it. Um, Gabby asks, do you recommend most of your upper cervical instability patients do atlas orthogonal in addition to PRP or stem cells? Yes, uh, I do. Um, either that or, or NUCA. Um, uh, and again, most of those patients respond pretty well to that stuff. So if they respond well, I'd like them to do that. Now, we do have some patients that can't tolerate it and they don't do well, in which case they shouldn't do it. Uh, but there are also super experts in that field, people like Scott Rosa in New York, who can really dial in the adjustment much, much more specifically, um, and then look on MRI to see whether or not there's better cerebral spinal fluid flow uh, on the MRI. Um, so, you know, there are, there are levels of understanding there as well. Right. Um, now, you mentioned what half a dozen companies tested uh, with cord blood either here or other places. How, how many do you think that are out there selling this? Is that the limit? Are there 20 companies? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, it's like whack-a-mole. Literally, yeah. it, this, this is so easy to do. So as an example, um, I just found a new one last week. I'd never heard of Biogenics. Uh, I looked this company up. I went to the website. The company claimed to be the world leader in regenerative medicine. Now, once I actually did some research on this company, this company seems to have 13 employees and only two of them or three of them seem to work there full time. The rest of them were all contracted sales reps. Um, and it's based out of an office suite someplace in Houston. So it seems to be uh, a small company that's again, private labeling someone else's tissue. And that's what we tend to see is a lot of private labeling out there. So as an example, we just tested CharCore and StemV from the Utah Cord Bank. Now I can tell you because of the, the, the profiles on these two from a scientific standpoint, they're probably both sourced from the Utah Cord Bank. One's called CharCore, uh, the other one's called StemV that's made by Utah Cord Bank. So it's pretty clear to me from a scientific standpoint that CharCore is contracting with the Utah Cord Bank. Now you never know that because it looks like a different product but the bottom line is there's only six or seven of these cord banks around the country that you can do this with, or tissue banks. And uh, so unless you're willing to create a multi-million dollar collection process on your own, which these companies generally aren't, you gotta buy someone else's product and then label it as your own, which generally tends to happen. So there's about 20 on the market. How many are unique? probably only five or six. There's probably only five or six variations on a theme here of uh, these products. Um, you wouldn't know that they're the same exact product, but they are. They're just private labeled by some sales rep who decided one day to create a company. Any idea how they collect this stuff? Usually um, scheduled births or C-sections, um, but that's the problem. Um, think about it. You know, in a private hospital where a lot of people are saving their cords, this isn't going to work. It's only going to work in a public hospital. It's only uh, problems where this stuff gets. Uh, put in a freezer, or, or I'm sorry, puts in, gets put in a refrigerator, it sits around for a while, someone comes in and then collects it, they then drive it across town, it sits in a refrigerator, they then get around to processing it, uh, it's put into bottles, it's cryopreserved, it's, it then sits in a freezer for a number of months until it's sold, and then gets shipped halfway across the country, then it gets shock thought in the doctor's office, usually in their hand. So by the time you get to all of that, you don't have many living cells, certainly not li many living mesenchymal stem cells. And, and they sterilize it somehow before all that, right? There's two ways you can do it. One way is you can sterilize it. The problem is if you sterilize it, you kill all the cells in it by, uh, by definition. Uh, the other is that you can test it for diseases, and there's a panel of diseases that you can test it for. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. I, saw a product the other day that we had uh, gotten to test, and the testing certificate said that the product had CMV, cytomegalovirus. 
I looked it up. Cytomegalovirus um, is allowed to be present. Um, wow. So uh, giving this to a patient would give them cytomegalovirus. Now, cytomegalovirus, unless you're immunocompromised, is not a big deal. But it was bizarre to, to see that, that this was a product that knew that it was infected with cytomegalovirus and they still sold it. I don't think I'd want that. <laughs> yeah, I had decided that I wouldn't want CMV either. Uh, on the off chance that it became immunocompromised or had cancer at one point, then it would become a big problem. Uh, Sally asks how we would uh, go about treating a disc bulge in the neck. Yeah, Sally, uh, look at some of my blogs on this topic, but the bottom line is I've got a couple of disc bulges in my neck. Uh, we've treated that through platelet-based treatments very successfully, and usually that's all that's required um, is platelet-based treatments. Now, every once in a while, we'll need to use a stem cell-based treatment. Uh, I just treated someone like that down in Grand Cayman for a cervical disc bulge, uh, but that's more rare that we'll need to go that direction. Uh, Marisol asks, um, what are the dangers of using stem cells? Yeah, very good question. So the first big danger of using someone else's cells is contamination. Uh, there was just a, uh, a Livion problem. Livion was a product. Uh, there was more than a dozen people that ended up in the ICU critically ill because it was contaminated and some of it was injected IV and some of it, a lot of it was injected into the spine. I'm actually the medical expert on those cases right now. I think I've got all 12 of them or so. There's about a dozen. Um, and those attorneys have reached out to me as an expert because I'm an expert in this, this field and can testify that the doctors had no business, for instance, putting this stuff in a low back disc. Uh, those people were almost died. Some of them were really critically ill in the ICU. Uh, then you get into, obviously, uh, any type of injection could cause an infection. So there's always that small risk, and that's a real risk. That's not a fake risk. That happens with any injection you do, whether it's this stuff or a steroid or an anesthetic. So there's that risk of an, the infection risk from an injection. And then uh, if you're doing known stuff like bone marrow, where we've collected lots of data, um, not much risk because uh, we've published on all that stuff. If you're using umbilical cords in your disc, God knows what, what the risk is. Nobody knows. Uh, so that's, that's the problem uh, that we have is that for most of this stuff um, that's being used out there, there are no published uh, risk factors. No one really understands what the risks are. If you're sticking with your own bone marrow, there are, there are definitely uh, known risk matrices, and that's pretty well dialed in at this point. All right, good answers. Uh, Lee asks, is the ligamentum flavin exposed to PRP or stem cells when injecting the facet joints, or is it a separate procedure? Yeah, so we call it a ligamentum flavoplasty, and basically it's a separate injection into the ligamentum flavum. Uh, it's pretty technically demanding, not, not necessarily easy to do, it's certainly not something that you learn in a pain management fellowship, so it's a procedure that we invented. And uh, our fellows know how to do it, and we've trained some of the Regenix doctors how to do it. But it's a specific injection into the ligament and flavum. Uh, Sarah, earlier we answered this question about adhesive arachnoiditis, um, which... Yeah, so Sarah, I think that uh, if that were me, what I would try would be using a catheter-based treatment with platelet lysate, uh, meaning uh, the growth factors from blood platelets, that's probably the first thing to try. That tends to be anti-inflammatory, and you'll get a dissection effect of the scar off of the nerve without the need for surgery. So that's probably, if it were me, what I would try first, or have my doctors try first in, in me personally. And just so you guys know, I had just gotten a bunch of injections right before I walked in this door. Um, I had my low back injected, the side of my hip injected, and my knee. So, um, you know, I, I'm not just a hair club president, I'm a user as well. <laughs> uh, referring to the hair club commercials that were common, I don't see them anymore. But no. They, they kind of went out of business maybe or something. He bought the business because it worked so well. There you go. Um, uh, Ronald, we answered this a little earlier, but we'll hit it one more time. How about using stem cells from family or children for healing? Yeah, it's not legal. 
uh, that's for sure. So uh, the only way it could be used would be for cancer. Outside of that, that would be an illegal use and uh, would not be legal for a cord bank to release that to another person uh, for any use outside of cancer. So look, if you're hearing this, please share this with other people so they can understand the truth about some of this stuff and get the right kind of procedure for their condition. Austin asks, if some percentage of the stem cells don't reach the target and settle in non-target issues, uh, tissues, uh, can they cause harm? Yeah, well that is the reason why IV stem cell use is by far the most dangerous thing you can do. Um, meaning that, think about it, <coughs> if I give you IV stem cells uh, and I'm trying to track all of those patients for any kind of complications, that's completely different than tracking for complications in your knee. Meaning if I put them in your knee and I've got some research that shows they'll stay in your knee, then I only need to look at your knee uh, and then secondarily everything else to see what those complications might be. But if I inject those IV, uh, they could end up any place, uh, theoretically. So I've got to uh, surveil all of those patients for any and all possible diseases. I just took a small but very difficult manageable problem from a research standpoint and turned it into a total nightmare from a research standpoint. So that's why we won't know for 20, 30 years whether or not these people getting umbilical cord uh, injections IV right now have any kind of problem uh, because that's not been done. This stuff's been only used in kids with cancer. Um, so we know what that looks like, but we have not a clue what happens when this stuff is used for anti-aging purposes. I mean, for all we know, half of these people are gonna end up growing an eye in the middle of their, their forehead here in the next 10 years, meaning we literally don't know that. Right. Uh, Jason asks, if, not, if a, not a Regenex procedure or a Regenex doctor, who else would we recommend for a low back condition? Yeah, so I would go to the Interventional Orthopedics Foundation. Uh, it's interventionalorthopedics.org uh, uh, or IOF. Uh, so if you go to interventionalorthopedics.org, uh, they have a list of folks that they have trained. Um, and those, that's a very rigorous, very nice training program. So that's a good place to start. And there are hundreds of physicians that are a part of that. Yeah, I saw we just had a course, or there was just a course in uh, where Atlanta this year, this weekend. And yeah, they had one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, and then they also teach here in Denver. Uh, all of our doctors are IOF instructors, um, and uh, so it's a good good group. Great. Um, Gabby asks about um, X-ray dosage one's exposed to during the PICL treatment. Yeah, small x-ray uh, exposure. So the x-ray exposure uh, there is going to be less, excuse me, Gabby, <coughs> uh, less than you would see uh, with something like um, a chest x-ray or a couple cross-country plane trips, meaning that cross-country plane trips expose, uh, expose you to radiation. Um, so let's say about the same amount that a pilot would get after uh, flying his routes for a couple of weeks. Uh, that's approximately the same x-ray exposure. All right. Um, let's see here. No other questions coming in right now. Uh, is there anything else? Do we want to talk about uh, this group or? Yeah, so, so we are, um, you know, uh, as you, if you read the blog this morning, you, you've seen what I perceive as a huge problem. We have these Facebook groups uh, that are really sales funnels for organizations trying to sell certain kind of stem cell treatments. And there's nothing wrong with providing information. I mean, this is a free country. That's great. We need to provide information, but the information has got to be good information. Um, and what I, what I saw when I, when I joined one of these groups was it was a free-for-all. Um, there was no medical curation of the information. There was no knowledgeable person stepping in and saying, hey, you know what? You might want to look at this because what you just said is not really accurate. I know someone told you that, but here's some information you might want to look at. So uh, we've now started uh, our own Facebook group um, so that we can 
uh, make sure that the doctors that are allowed to answer questions in that group will have to be IOF certified. Now, they won't all be Regenix doctors. Some of them will have nothing to do with Regenix. But if they want to answer questions on, from patients, they're going to have to go through the Interventional Orthopedics Foundation to even be allowed in the group to answer questions. Uh, because it, it's a huge void. These groups, from what I've seen, are just uh, free-for-alls, and we're trying to see if we can do this right. Now, maybe it will fail. Maybe it won't work. But we're going to give it a shot to try to answer people's questions. Yeah, that's great. And you can find this stem cell stem cells Q and A with the expert, with the experts. Stem cell Q and A with the experts. You can find it under groups, uh, and uh, that should be available right now if you want to uh, get in there and start asking good questions to get good valid answers. Yeah. Again, our goal is is to make sure that there's some expert leadership there rather than the free for all that I've seen. Uh, Marisol asked about stem cells for MS. Yeah, Marisol, that's not what we do. Our focus is orthopedics, but I know some excellent providers out there. Uh, you know, what I'd recommend there, there's a group, uh, Stem Cell Pioneers. So if you look it up on Google, stem, just type in Stem Cell Pioneers. And uh, Barb Hansen, uh, who's a patient, runs that group. And so I like a lot of these groups on Facebook that are run by clinics and financial interests. This is really run by patients who are trying to help patients. So if you've got MS, ALS, any non-orthopedic thing, that's your source. That's your go-to area. So look them up and, and get on that group. It really is patients trying to help patients. And they will let you know there are many, many patients on there with MS. And they'll let you know uh, the clinics that really do a good job. Great. Uh, Kevin asks about uh, uh, fasting to increase stem cells before a procedure. When would you do it? Would you go into the procedure fasted? Would you do it afterwards? Yeah, you know, I think the best thing that I've seen out there and probably the easiest thing is that Prolon diet. So it's ProlonMD.com uh, or FMD, FMD. ProlonFMD.com. Uh, FMD stands for a fasting mimicking diet. And basically they take you down to... What is it, about 700 calories? Yeah. yeah. They start out at about 1,000 calories. They'll take you down to seven to 800 calories. And it's a really nice way to prepare for a procedure. It's a five-day program. And, you know, you don't feel like you're starving on it, um, which is great. So it's, it's probably the easiest way to do that and uh, really get the benefits. And it's been researched uh, by some university physicians out of California so it's, it's the real deal. It's not uh, just uh, fluff. Right. Um, Sally asks about how uh, platelet lysate can help heal a disc. Yeah, Sally, we would normally wouldn't use platelet lysate in the disc. So realize that, that I believe that PRP and stem cell procedures are done far too often in the disc. Um, that about 80% of the time, if you stay out of the disc, you can treat the patient's problem very effectively uh, with high success rates, usually with just platelet-based procedures, but sometimes stem cells. Then you've got intradiscal injections, meaning injecting into the disc. And injecting into the disc is usually high-dose PRP or bone marrow concentrate or culture-expanded stem cells. So that's what we inject into a disc, but that's only for very, very specific things. So if a patient has a painful tear in their disc, uh, they'll respond very well to that kind of treatment. If a patient has a disc bulge, we can many times get rid of the disc bulge with a culture expanded procedure injected into the annular fibers that are bulging. But those patients are few and far between. Most of what we do is outside the disc and platelet based procedures like the one I just had work well. I mean, I could have gotten anything, right? I could have gotten my own cultured stem cells if I wanted them. I could have got my own same day stem cells. What did I just do? I just did a platelet procedure in my back. Uh, so if, if I can do it, it's not gonna cost me a dime and I could have done anything I wanted to do. Why would I do that? Uh, why? Because I know what works and I know what the risk versus benefit is and we didn't go into my disc. All right, great. Uh, Stacy, we will get that Facebook group uh, posted on this page later tonight. Um, if we can work it into a blog, I'm sure we will. 
Uh, we'll be very forthcoming with that here in the near future. And please share this with your friends so they can find out more about this. Um, what do you know about Dr. Royden in Panama and uh, Mel Gibson swears by him curing his father's ailments? Any truth to this? Yeah, listen, I, I think um, it's interesting. I, I've talked to patients that have been treated in Panama who have then gone to Cayman. So that's been my experience. Uh, I think they grow good cells down there. I think that one of the, the struggles they have is that uh, it's impossible to get a USMD licensed in Panama or any place in, in Central or South America. Why? Because the local yokels do not allow that. So the problem is that you're dealing with local physicians and a good cell source. So if it's something simple, I think that uh, it's probably a good place to go if you're looking for that kind of stuff. If it's something more complex, um, then you're, you don't have U.S. physicians down there, you don't have U.S. trained physicians. So the, the, the quality of the medical care is going to be a step down. Uh, that's been my experience. So for instance, when I saw someone uh, last year who had been there, they got a simple blind intraarticular knee injection. The guy may or may not have been in the knee, who knew, but it paid, he paid a lot of money for it, but he was dealing with a local yokel doc. Neil is not a physician, so he didn't understand how that needed to be done. Uh, but they were probably great cells, and they may or may not have ever gotten in the joint. Now, we did it the correct way down in Cayman. He responded very nicely. Uh, and uh, we did it, obviously, under x-ray and ultrasound guidance. It's a big procedure. It's not a little teeny tiny, tiny deal. It's just sticking a needle in there and, you know, doing the, the sign of the cross, which is what, what they probably did in Panama. So it's a, it's a different thing. So it all depends on what you've got. But I think Neil grows good cells down there. Um, I'd like to see more research published by Neil on what it is they're doing, meaning that they probably have a complication rate and that should be published and I've not seen that at all out of that clinic yet. So I'd like to see that kind of stuff come out of there. We've published all of our complication stuff. Neil should be doing the same. Whose cells are they using down there? You know, it's mostly umbilical cord uh, expanded. They also use, it's my understanding, some autologous but mostly umbilical cord expanded uh, cells. So could you end up still with that graft versus host issue? Yeah, so, so realize that once you get to isolated and culture expanded MSCs, it's a little different world. Uh, you're not gonna get graft versus host disease, but what you will get is if you've got a good match, they'll work well. If you've got a poor match, your body's gonna eat them up. So that's, that's basically the issue there. It's only when you're using these products here in the United States where you're getting umbilical cord nucleated cells uh, that you've got this whole uh, graft versus host disease mismatch issue. Stacy, I'll tell Dr. Schultz you think he's a rock star. He's a great doctor. Oh, great. John will be happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Gladys asks, is the PICL injection, can it help uh, with uh, stretched ADI, six millimeters, I presume? Yeah, ADI is the atlantodental interspace, so that would be a stretched transverse ligament. Uh, and a six millimeter ADI, the answer is yes, that's something this procedure uh, could address and deal with. But again, I, I, I would need to see the films, I need to know the, the, you know, the history context, but that doesn't uh, concern me all that much, uh, but the rest of it needs to be looked at as well. And so I want to suggest as well, if you're looking for a good doctor trained in this, using these Regenex procedures, go to the Regenex website. You can find a physician right there, see who's local, maybe take your x-ray MRI in and have a, a one-hour evaluation with them and get these answers very specifically uh, addressed for you. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, are all the Regenex docs trained to inject iliolumbar ligaments? Uh, yes, if they're doing spine, they should be trained to do the iliolumbar ligament. So that should be one that's on the, the basic skills list of, of every Regenix physician doing spine. Realize that we don't allow any physician to do spine who doesn't have interventional spine training to begin with. And then they would learn an iliolumbar uh, ligament injection through Regenix because that's not something you would learn in a spine fellowship. Kevin asks, uh, is the accessory ligament injected during the PICL treatment? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, it's interesting. The, the anatomy is different than you see in textbooks. 
you tend to see the alar ligaments coming out of the top and the accessory ligaments on the side but like many things in the body they're linked um, and they're connected so the accessory ligament tissue flows into the alar ligament tissue once you inject into it um, so uh, different than you see in the anatomy books uh, the body is usually more connected than that all right, well, we are uh, slowing down on questions. Um, any, uh, any final thoughts here? Yeah, you know, I wanted to do Facebook Live for two reasons. One was to try to make sure that people aren't getting scammed out there. I mean, we are in epic maximum scam mode right now. I've never seen anything quite like this. And frankly, in all likelihood, the FDA is probably gonna step it in and shut it all down here pretty darn quickly, meaning that we're probably going to see some some jail sentences handed out. We're going to see some really Very good. We will be back next week. We've got uh, a series of these in the next few weeks, so look for us next Monday as well. We'll be covering another hot topic in this crazy space. And want to thank you all for tuning in. Again, Regenx.com, find a physician in your neighborhood, and uh, please share this with your family and friends so they can uh, get the truth of things as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.